So as Julie said, we are right in the middle of this this series called Seven Sayings of the Cross. This is week four. And uh, oh, by the way, we the front half of the the, the lights aren't working, so we're going to do something that's going to be uncomfortable for about thirty seconds. We're going to turn the fluorescent lights on. So be like, you might want to do this if you have shades. You might want to turn those, put those shades on. So in three, two, one. Okay, whoa, hang on. Uh, and and we'll, we'll bring that into the message later, the, the whole fluorescent deal. It's going to fit. So, um, and we're, we're going to work on this for next week. But So we're right in the center, right in the middle of this series, uh, Seven Sayings of the Cross. We're looking at uh, one saying as, as Jesus hung on the cross, these, these statements that are recorded in the Gospels, short yet incredible sayings and statements. And uh, one one a week leading up to Easter. This is week four. And and have you like if you've been coming to this series, if you've been here, maybe this is week two or three or four for you. Have you been getting something from this? Like been challenged by these sayings we've been looking at? It, just feel free to respond if like this has been speaking to you in some way. Yeah. Um, God's been doing some really cool stuff in this series. Uh, five people have taken the step of becoming followers of Jesus in the last three weeks of this series. Let's give it up for for those individuals that have taken that step. Uh, new people have been kind of engaging with what's going on here at Revolution. It's been so cool to see that in uh, and, and utilizing Facebook as a way to kind of connect with what's happening here at Revolution. Uh, a guy named Chris just started coming in this series. He posted this on our Facebook page just a couple weeks ago. I'll, I'll just read a little bit of it. He said, just come as you are, take in the worship and hear the true message in a laid back, honest way with fellow brothers and sisters. I feel comfortable here. I feel a sense of belonging I never have before. It's short but it quickly gets to the point. It's a closely knit community that's growing and has a clear vision for the future. I'm so thankful and blessed that God led me to revolution out of a rough situation. I needed a fresh start. I needed to hit the reset button. This is where I want to be grounded in my hometown. So that's really cool. Just somebody that's getting connected over this series. Then a lady named Dawn actually posted this this week as she's getting connected here. The music, the pastor, and the welcoming of the family to this church. I learned here that church is not a place you go to. It's something you belong to. What an incredible thing. Um, and that's what we talked about last week, that, that church is not something you go to. It's a family we belong to, as we talked about. So I, I just want to give a challenge here before we really get into this, the fourth thing. Um, for the church family... Because we said this too, uh, here's what Sunday is about at Revolution, and hopefully you remembered this, if you didn't write this down last week, write it down today, and, and if someone asks you about, you know, what's Sunday about, what is Revolution about, here's what it's about, Sunday morning is a party where the family gets together, and we're always expecting guests, that's what it is, and the kids just started partying over here, we'll hear them for the next 10 minutes partying, so uh, uh, Sunday morning is a party where the family gets together and we're always expecting guests, so if you're a guest today, if this is your first, second week, something like that, we were expecting you, we were hoping you would be here, we planned for, for guests to be here, we hope that you'll get connected with what's happening here at Revolution, even on this Sunday, and connect with kind of the message and all that's going on, so, I, but I have, a, I have a challenge for the church family. We, we have a vision for more and more people to get connected with revolution and to be impacted by the mission of revolution. Our mission is to help people find Jesus and live like him. That's what everything's about. And, and we, we have a vision. We want to see north central Indiana and beyond transformed by the gospel message. We, like we seriously want to be a small part of Jesus changing a region called north central Indiana and then beyond that. We believe God's going to use us to be part of that, and we have very specific vision over the next two years. It's called Imagine 320. I got the gear on. We're taking another step in Imagine 320 tonight at the new space. As Julie talked about, 620. You don't want to miss it. It's going to be a really exciting night. But the vision is simple. We want to move into a new, bigger space to connect more and more people here at Revolution, and we want to send a church planter out into another community to start another Revolution-type church. That in both of those steps are going to impact hundreds and hundreds of people. I, we're, we're going to see so many more people take that step of placing faith in Jesus, posting on social media, I'm getting connected, here's what's happening through my, or in my life through revolution. And, and so I just want to challenge us, if, if you're part of the church family, in order for this vision to happen, it takes the church family stepping up with our resources to move this forward. And I mean our resource of time, We've been saying pray boldly, serve boldly, right? 
a resource of time. And we've had so many people over at that new space. We have so many people serving here. If you're not serving, if you're not praying for things, step it up. Uh, pray at 320 every day. That's one of the things. And, and our resource of finances, like coming together. If, you, if you've been coming just for a few weeks, you might even be thinking, like, how does giving even happen at Revolution? Like, I never hear anything about it. They don't pass the plate. And, and honestly, that's one of the things that really sets Revolution apart as kind of different. We, one of the great things about Revolution is we don't pass the plate. And you can take that next step of giving whenever you're ready. One of the tough things about Revolution is we don't pass the plate. And you can take that next step whenever you're ready. So I I just wanted to challenge us right in the center of this series as new people are getting connected and God's doing some really awesome things. If you're part of the church family, I just challenge you to step up in that area of generosity. Take a next step in that direction. If you've made a commitment to Imagine 320, keep that commitment up. Keep going forward with it. It's tax season. Maybe it's a great opportunity to, to, to make a big contribution toward that commitment. And, um, and, and we've been saying this too, the, the more giving that happens on the front end of this vision, the further, faster we can kind of move forward with, with the vision God's given us. So if, if your life is being impacted, what I'm saying is if your life is being impacted, then be part of impacting others. That's what the whole family of the church is about. And there's more information in the info card if you want to know, well, how does giving happen? It's right there. You open that info card, bottom left. It talks about uh, the giving station right out there and electronic ways that you can you can give. And, and for those that are faithfully contributing already, thank you. Thank you so much. I mean, it's just amazing the first three, four months of this uh, financial campaign, what God's been doing. So thank you. We're moving forward because of your generosity. So let's keep it up together. So let me just pray for that, and let me pray for us as we move into week four. God, I thank you for what's happened over in Revolution Kids. Just awesome to hear kids singing out words to you. Um, I'm, I know my kids are over there. A couple of them are over there. So uh, just just give our kids passion to follow you with all their lives. Uh, be with us in this room as we dive into this fourth saying, probably the, the toughest saying of the cross. And I pray that you would be with our church as we continue moving forward with Imagine 320. Uh, for those that haven't yet taken that step of generosity, that you would move in their heart. For those that are, that you would keep the momentum going. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So, there, there was a moment during the crucifixion of Jesus where he spoke probably one of the most popular phrases or one of the most well-known phrases in all the Bible. Even if, if you're not a Bible person, maybe you haven't read the Bible, I, I would guess you've probably heard about this phrase, um, heard that Jesus spoke this phrase or whatever. And, and I think the reason this is probably the most popular or we've heard this the most is because we connect with it the most. We connect with this, this phrase, this saying Jesus speaks. And he actually cries this statement out. As we're going to see that in a few minutes as we read it. There's some, there's some extreme emotion behind this saying of the cross. And today, to get that fourth saying, we're going to go to the Gospel of Matthew. Uh, week one and two, we were in Luke. Uh, last week, we looked at John's Gospel. And today, we're going to look at Matthew. So Matthew was a follower of Jesus. He was an eyewitness of much of what he wrote down. He was a tax collector that gave up everything to follow Jesus. He, he had status in Rome. He had a good job. Uh, he, gave, he gave up all of that to follow Jesus. He eventually gave up his life in Ethiopia because he was a follower of Christ. Gave up all of it, not for what he believed. Listen, he didn't give that up for what he believed. He gave it up for what he saw with his own eyes. He saw the resurrection. He saw these things. And he gave up everything for it. And, and here's some of what Matthew remembered from the event of the crucifixion. Matthew 27, 33, it says, They came to a place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. And I, I, I wanted, if you were here last week, I wanted to get into this a little bit, and, and, and maybe this is just for a few of us. I kind of geek out over this kind of stuff, but uh, we, we don't really know. We, we know the name of the place where Jesus was crucified, but we don't really know exactly where it was. Uh, we said last week that Uh, Jesus was crucified somewhere along the outskirts of the city of Jerusalem. We get that from John's Gospel, even Matthew. And and, um, and there there are two main traditional locations where historians and scholars believe it might have been. If you go over to Jerusalem today. By the way, has anybody been to Israel? Like you've, you've been there? Okay, we got one. Awesome. 
Talk to this guy right here. Talk to Lucas if you want to know more about Israel. He, he's the genius. Uh, anyway, no. So, uh, but but uh, there's two locations. If you go over there, if you visit, that are traditionally held as places that it could have happened. The first is the Church of the of the Holy Sepulcher. It's in the Christian quarter of the old city of Jerusalem. We we have a picture of this. Um, and 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 the church. This church contains, according to traditions dating all the way back to the fourth century, possibly the two most holy sites in all of Christianity. Uh, the, the event of the, the crucifixion and the resurrection. So you can check that out. You can look more into it. The other site that gets quite a bit of attention, at least over the last two centuries, is a place called Skull Hill. And, of course, this is seen as a potential site, if you can see kind of the skull face that's over on the, uh, the right side of, of the hill there. Um, it, this is seen as a potential site because it's kind of on the outskirts of the city. Golgotha was the place of the skull. They think, well, maybe that's where it got its name was this hill here. So, and, and that's all interesting to me. But here's what I think is more important as far as the location. Another thing I've discovered in my research as, as we're trying to kind of immerse ourselves in this scene, trying to get ourselves to be there and understand what's happening because we're, we're so far removed from it today as Americans. But, but some of the other research I did, I found out that Jesus was more than likely not crucified on top of a hill. Mostly because of the pictures that depict the event and, and movies we watch and paintings and, and I think even songs that kind of describe it. My mind goes right to kind of imagining it happening on a hill. And uh, you know, for, again, from the research I've done in this series, Rome rarely, if ever, crucified on top of a hill. They might have done it at a hill or kind of beside a hill. But more often, they would do it right alongside the road or the gates of the city right next to the road or the gates of the city, because they wanted everyone that was passing by the event, traveling to and from Jerusalem, to see the, the person being crucified and to see the penalty if you oppose Rome. They wanted you to be up close and personal with the victim on the cross and with what was happening. They, they wanted people to see and hear the agony of what was going on. And, and even people would participate in the event. as We're going to see that in Matthew's gospel. People are, are insulting and, and doing things to the crucified victims. And so, so just imagine, like imagine as the scene's happening by a road, by a gate. People are passing by. New people are seeing this. And this is some of what they're seeing and participating in. Verse 34. It says, There they offered Jesus wine to drink mixed with gall. But after tasting it, he refused to drink it. When they had crucified him... They divided up his clothes by casting lots. And sitting down, they kept watch over him there. Above his head, they placed a written charge against him. This is Jesus, the king of the Jews. Two rebels were crucified with him, one on his right, one on his left. And we talked about the the rebels or the criminals, the thieves, in in week two. And you can catch up online. It's all up online. Uh, Verse 39, those who passed by hurled insults at him, shaking their heads and saying, You who are going to destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself. Come down from the cross if you're the Son of God. And in the same way, the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and the elders mocked him again, walking back and forth. He saved others, they said, but he can't save himself. He's the King of Israel. Let him come down now from the cross and we'll believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God rescue him now if he wants wants him. For he said, I'm the Son of God. And don't miss this. This is what we got to really get as we're kind of imagining this scene. It says, from noon until three in the afternoon. Let's read this. Darkness came over all the land. And here's where that fourth saying is spoken. Let's go to the next. About three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice. He's been on the cross for hours, and he cries out in a loud voice. I'm just going to give us the English rendition. My God, my God. Why have you forsaken me? I'm sure with much more emotion and much more volume than I just spoke. It's interesting that if if you read the gospel stories of the life of Jesus, the title that he most often refers to God with is Father, Abba, Daddy. But in this moment, he uses a different title. And instead of saying Dad, Abba, Father, Papa, or you know, whatever, he says, My God, my God. He cries it out. I mean, there's some, some raw, gut-wrenching, agonizing emotion coming out from the mouth of Jesus. And this is perhaps one of the saddest, most emotional statements in the Bible. It's definitely one of the most controversial. 
Uh, th- this statement has, has stumped theologians and Bible scholars and even church leaders for 2,000 years, ever since it was written down or ever since it was heard. Uh, Martin Luther, the great reformer, centuries ago, as he was kind of wrestling with this saying of the cross, he asked this question. He said, how can God forsake God? How, a great question. How can God forsake God? The answer is, I have no idea. I don't know. I can't explain this. And there are so many theological challenges in this question. I can't even begin to answer, like, what was this statement really about? Why did Jesus use these exact words? Uh, Was this a cry of defeat? Philosopher Albert Schweitzer thought so. He, He saw this cry as, this is a quote, he said, This is the disappointing denouncement to the earthly ministry of Christ. This was a cry where this failed revolutionary petitions God for aid in his final hour and receives none. The cry of a disillusioned prophet who had believed that God was going to rescue him at the 11th hour and then felt forsaken. I mean, is that what this is about? That this this man that, that spoke the ultimate message of hope lost hope in the final moments? That, that God in his son's moment of, of deepest pain abandoned his son? And if that's what happened, then why would we ever refer back to this event as Good Friday? I mean, there's nothing good about God turning his back on his one and only son. Why did Jesus say this? I don't know exactly. Uh, I I tend to believe that that this cry was actually a quote, a a reference to another place in Scripture, maybe a fulfillment of that Scripture. A a song had actually been written a thousand years before this, and and King David, the second king of Israel, wrote down this song with the exact same words in Hebrew. Here's here's exactly how it's translated into English. My God, my God, Psalm 22.1. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Word for word. And David continues, he says, Why are you so far from saving me, so far from the cries of my anguish? My God, I cry out by day, but you do not answer. By night, but I find no rest. And this goes on for another 17 verses before David ever comes out of this pit of despair. Just, God, where are you? What's going on? Why is this happening? Why have you turned your back on me? Why have you forsaken me? So, bottom line, I don't know exactly what Jesus was saying on the cross and exactly why he was saying this. And I don't think we really need to know the exact theological explanation. Jesus was fully God, he was fully man, which meant he felt every bit of pain and agony and humiliation on the cross. This very well could have been a heart cry from him to his dad. God, why have you forsaken me? This could be Jesus quoting a verse he definitely would have memorized years before. It could be a combination of both. Who knows? I don't know. I just know that Jesus, after He spoke it, He stayed on the cross. He pressed on through the pain. And He gave up His very life for us. And I simply want to ask us this question today. How do you respond when things go dark? I want us to really think about this question. How do you respond when things go dark? Because there's there's a moment, or maybe even a season, that eventually happens in everyone's journey. It doesn't matter if you're here today and you are a follower of Jesus or not a follower of Jesus or somewhere in the middle. Like there is a there's a moment in everyone's journey or a season in everyone's journey where it gets dark. It seems dark. And actually, uh, Matthew, the guy that wrote down this fourth saying of the cross. Earlier in the story, in Matthew chapter 5, he quoted Jesus as saying this. Jesus said, For God gives His sunlight to both the evil and the good, and He sends rain on the just and unjust alike. Pretty much saying everyone, everyone in the world is going to experience bright days and dark days, you know, sunny days and rainy days. Everybody. It doesn't matter if you're just, unjust, good, bad. We're all going to experience it. And the darkness looks different for all of us. I mean, maybe darkness for you, it it relates to that video that was between the worship songs. Maybe maybe you have like a prodigal child that that grew up in the church and and they they just kind of turned away from God and and you've been praying for years for them and like, God, get a hold of their heart, do something. And it's it's been a long time and and seemingly no answer from God so far. Maybe Maybe you've been struggling with infertility. And you've spent years crying out to God and asking for a baby and trying every option the medical field offers and still, you know, no answer from God yet. You might have a sick family member 
Maybe a sick family member that seemingly has their whole life in front of them still and you don't get it and and there's no reason, there's no purpose that God could possibly have in this. And God, I know you can do anything and I know you can just heal them. Why don't you do it, God? You might have a spouse that's turned their back on God. Maybe you've lost someone close to you and, and there's questions around it and just struggling with that. Maybe, maybe you're just struggling because like God's decisions are not lining up and meshing with your desires. That's happened many times for me. Like what I want and what God's kind of doing, it's not really coming together exactly like I would hope. Uh, may, maybe, maybe you can't like pinpoint something like a circumstance or situation, but it just feels like God is distant. Like I just, I don't, there's not really anything in life that's happening but it just, God, it just feels like you're a million miles away right now. It seems a little dark right now. And see, it's, it's really easy to trust God when things are going well, when the sun's shining. It's difficult to trust God, for many of us, when life goes dark. And what I want to do today, I want to show us an illustration that it, it's really a challenge for how do we respond when life goes dark. And it's interesting, I actually did this illustration toward the beginning of the church. And as I was preparing the message this week, like the illustration came back to my mind. I'm like, and I revisited it, I, I rethought kind of through it, and, and God just kind of brought my story and the story of our church and, and some of your stories into this illustration. I'm like, i got to share it. So maybe a handful of you have seen this, uh, but again, God just showed so much to me through this again. Um, but we'll, we'll just call this the, the faith journey illustration. Because I don't think there's a better word to describe our faith than this word right here. I mean, it, it truly is a journey. If you've been doing this Jesus thing for a while, like this is what it's like. And, and the journey, if, if, I mean, the normal journey has lots of dips and cliffs and ups and downs and Good days, bad days, bright days, dark days, you know. It's like this. This is what following Jesus is like right here. And let's just say that this X right here represents someone that hasn't yet decided to follow Christ with their life. And maybe you're here today because, I mean, every week at Revolution, and you, you don't get the emails, you don't get the Facebook messages. I hear it almost every week. There is somebody in this room right now. You're right here. You're not sure yet. And maybe you got science questions or you grew up in it and it just it, you kind of walked away from it or whatever. And, and for, maybe there's circumstances that are kind of uh, causing you to question God, whatever. But you're here, you're kind of seeking things out, and you are in the right church. We actually started Revolution to be a safe place for people seeking out faith. You can come forever and stay right here. And you're part of Revolution Church. No, no strings attached, you're part of this family. But what I know is if you keep coming and your heart's a little bit open to what's happening, the messages, the music, what, I mean, just the experience of revolution and, and, and Jesus, eventually you're going to take a step in the Jesus direction. Um, you, you might come on a Sunday and it, it just feels like the message is speaking right at you. Like you're in a seat with a room of 150, 200 people. You're like, uh, did he just prepare this? Did he read my Facebook post this week? Because it just feels like this. So and it just like starts coming alive and, and like you listen to the music and it's not just songs anymore. It just, it's like, man, those songs like are speaking to me. And like you're going to YouTube and, and re-listening through the week and you're starting to take some steps in the direction of Christ and you start opening the Bible by yourself, like not on Sunday, but like through the week and it's like the words are jumping off the page and speaking and like wow like maybe God's doing something I don't God I don't know and just keep taking maybe you get connected with some people at revolution like in relationship and you're like wow these people are like real people they're not the weird church people I used to be connected with like they they talk about real stuff and and so I'm, I'm really connecting and so maybe you know maybe there's something to this and you just keep taking some steps uh, eventually what happens is there's a point in your journey where you make this decision to follow Jesus. It happens. It might be in this room. It might be in a life group. We, we've seen it in so many different ways. It might be in a conversation with someone. But you decide to follow Jesus. And man, when you make this decision, it, it's awesome. 
Like if you've been there, if you remember back, like when you first made that decision, I mean, you are riding high for weeks, months. It's, it's amazing. Like there's Monday morning's incredible and Tuesday morning's incredible and Friday morning's even more incredible because I mean, it's just off, it's off the charts and, and people at work are like, are you like, what have you, what's happened to you? Like you have like joy. Like what is love and peace? And I mean, those weren't true a few months ago. So, and I call this part of the journey uh, you're on the Jesus juice, okay? I mean, you are drinking the Jesus juice. Things are good. And this, this is so fun right here. This is amazing. Everything, I mean, the Bible comes to life. I mean, you, when you pray, God's like right in the room. But I also know this. This isn't real life forever. And at some point on the journey, if you're here, enjoy it. It's awesome. At some point on the journey, something's going to happen, and and you're going to question things a little bit. It might be an event that happens in your life. You might lose someone close to you. You might something bad might be just going on. You might lose a job. Something's you get diagnosed with something. You're like, okay, God, if you're good and and real and all that, then what what's up with this? And, And then you come on another Sunday, and you're like. Okay, Anthony must not have spent much time on the message this week because I did not connect with that at all. And then, you're, like, the band, they, I didn't get those songs. What was up with that? And, 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 and just, like, man, I, and, and your mom was hospitalized, and, and things are not going well, and, and, you, and you're not feeling it like you used to. And you enter this new season that St. John of the Cross calls the dark night of the soul. Henry Blackaby, he's a Christian author, he refers to it as the crisis of belief. For today's message, we'll call it the dark dip. I'm not talking about the devil's dip, that place you drive your car out north of town. I'm talking about the dark dip of your faith journey. It's tough. And and really where you're at, it's, it's where David was at in Psalm 22, right? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? What, what you're feeling and seeing and experiencing, what's going on in you, around you, the questions entering your mind, it's not lining up with what you used to think and believe and feel. And, and when what we're feeling and experiencing doesn't line up with what we used to feel and believe, then we wonder if it was ever true in the first place. And you're tempted to go one of two directions when things go dark, when you enter this season. You're tempted to go one of two directions. You're tempted to go back. Like, man, I just got to get back on the Jesus juice. Like, I, I just need to go to more church services. I just need to go to more retreats. I, I just need to keep doing stuff. I need to read more Bible. I need to listen to more songs. I, I just want to get that feeling back. I, that you were, we're tempted to go back to the Jesus juice or, or we're tempted to give up. Well, maybe if if this is how I'm feeling right now, and this is what I'm experiencing right now, maybe it wasn't even true to begin with. Maybe God's not who I thought he really was. And this is where a lot of people stall in their journey of faith. Right here. Some of you are there right now. In the room. Some of you are in this moment right here. Uh, When I was a student pastor, I would see teenagers, age 15 to 17, that, that grew up in the church, Right around in there, they're getting some freedom and, and driver's license and all that. And they start to think, okay, is this the faith? Like, is this really about, like, my faith or is this just about what I grew up in? And start kind of wrestling with the dark dip. A- another season is age 20 to 22. Go off to college, take a worldview class or, or an ethics class or something in college, philosophy, and start wondering, okay, with all those different beliefs out there, how is what I believe true? Uh, new followers of Jesus. We see this about the, the two-year mark. Like, you on the Jesus juice, some things happen after one year, and, and around two-year mark, you start wrestling in this dip. For those that have been following Jesus for a long time, my guess is you've been in this many, many times. Many, many times. But here's the deal. There is a third option. You were hoping so, right? I mean, go go back, give up. That don't sound good. There is a third option. Like like when you enter this crisis, this dark dip, this, this, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? There There is an option other than go back or give up. 
And the third option is to actually say, you know what, I realize that my faith is actually a journey. This is not just a metaphor, okay? It really is a journey. And it really is all over the place with emotion and faith and all that stuff. And I am not, I am not going to go back. I know that was just for a season. And I'm definitely not going to give up. I am going to choose through this season to press on. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to lean into this season and trust God. I'm going to choose to see and believe that God is really up to something good in here. And here's what, here's what I know too. And, and I also believe that it's not just going to get better if I change my thinking. Sometimes it gets worse before it gets better. But I am going to, even though I don't understand it, even though I don't even get what God's doing exactly, I don't understand the why, the what, the where, all those questions. But I'm going to lean into this and believe that God is somehow doing something good in me through this stuff right here. I'm going to trust God and hold on through this dip. I'm I'm believing He's going to show me something new. And on the other side of this, we get to a level of our faith that could have never happened on the Jesus juice. It could have never happened without the dip. It's a new, maturer level of our faith. A level of faith that's based more on who God is rather than what I feel. Which is, I think, especially as American followers of Jesus, how we base our faith so often. And again, here's what we know about the dip. Most people that are really close to God, you, you see somebody that you're like, man, they just ooze faith. Like, they are so close to God. They have been through this 15, 20 times. And held on to God through it. And we need the church family that we talked about so much through this season. And I, I relate so much to this illustration, again, as I kind of pulled it out and, and wrestled with it again this week. I thought of three, it, it, immediately, I didn't have to really think about it, just three different kind of seasons came to my mind over the last 15 years of this dark dip. One was uh, right after I, I got kind of out on my own, I was going to college, I took a worldviews class, and, and all these things like came to my mind that it, I'd never thought about before. You know, kind of all these thousands of beliefs out there, how do I know what I grew up in is true? And I had to, I read a book called Total Truth and a book called The Universe Next Door and I, I read The Question of God and, and, somebody, and I wrestled with apologetics. We, we did a series on that last year and I pressed on and I got to this new level in my faith journey that wasn't just based on feelings like this. It was based on, man, I know, I know this is true. There's evidence to this. About eight, nine years ago, my wife and I, we found ourselves out of ministry, out of the denomination that I grew up in. I'd served in for eight years. I was licensed in. And I was, I mean, we were here. We were struggling. We were questioning. It felt awful because things were being said about us and done, and it hurt, and, and some of them I had caused. And, but we held on. We found a new church family to be part of for another year and a half. And we pushed through this. We pressed on. And not only did our faith reach a new level, our marriage reached a new level. And then I thought about two years ago. It looked like finally, after five and a half years of planting revolution, we finally had our own building. The Sears building right down the road. A local buyer was going to buy the mall. We were going to buy Sears from them. And it's like, okay, God finally has opened the right door. The week before closing, everything fell apart. And I'm so selfish, you know, I, I, I think things have to go my way and what, it, how it works in my head. And I, I just, I, I wanted to, I, I don't think I've ever said this, in 2016, I wanted to quit pastoring. I, I, was, I just didn't get God at all. And I not only quit pastoring, I wanted to give it, like, give up on God certain days. Like, God, I just don't understand any of this. Of course, now we're two years removed from it and God's given us a new building and it's smaller and less overhead and less cost and all those things where we're, we're not just focused on Logansport, we're focused on reaching north central Indiana and sending out people, not just getting people out of building. So God just totally changed everything through this. But I didn't see it then because I'm so selfish. But I didn't give up. I pressed on and God showed up. Somewhere around here, God showed up. And again, maybe you're in the dark dip right now. Maybe you're fighting through something, divorce, lost loved one. Maybe you would would feel like Jesus on the cross right now and you think God has forsaken me. Maybe you're having a crisis of belief in the mind. 
If you will wrestle through this season I, and just trust God, there will be a new level on the other side. And, and the guy in the Bible that understood this more than anyone was the brother of Jesus. We talked about him a little bit last week. Let me just read what he says to start his book. James was crazy. Here's how he started his book. And think about how this relates to this. He says, Dear brothers and sisters, when troubles come your way, consider it an opportunity for great joy. This guy's off his rocker, right? So look at this. For you know that when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow, so let it grow, for when your endurance is fully developed, you will be perfect, complete, needing nothing. And I think that means after you've gone through this 45 times and you're in heaven. That's what that means, right? But and let, let, me, let me read you the message version of this. And if you've heard nothing else, get this. This is how the Message Bible puts it. So don't try to get out of anything prematurely. Some of you, you're here, and all you want to do is just get out. Stay in it a little bit. Don't try to get out of anything prematurely. Look at this. Let it do its work so you become mature and well-developed, not deficient in any way. God's doing something really good. We don't see it. We definitely don't feel it. But God is doing something really good in that. So where are you at? Where are you at with this? God wants to take us to the next level, but it means we must trust him in the dip, in the dark. And and here's what I know. No matter what that statement from Jesus on the cross exactly meant, I don't know. No matter exactly what was going on with that statement, here's what I do know. Jesus did not go back, and Jesus did not give up. Jesus pressed on, and he gave up his life for you and for me. And I will say this. Oftentimes, God is most powerfully present when we feel like he's blatantly absent. And I don't know where you're at, but I just want to pray for us. We're going to do one more song. I'm going to ask that we would stand together. Let's turn those fluorescents off. You can take your sunglasses off. Let's just pray. God, we are all at different places on this diagram. On this illustration, I pray for my friends in the room that, man, they're just, they're struggling to hang on. They're, they're not feeling it like they used to. That they wouldn't give up. That they wouldn't try to go back to that more immature way of thinking and feeling. But they would press on and know that their faith is developing and growing through this season. And God, as we sing this song that tells a story of what you've done in the world, and in our individual lives. Just be here, be here, be here. In your name, amen. So will I, God. So will we. No matter where we're at, whether it's on the top, in the sunny day, enjoying the beauty that is our life, the grace that we've been given, or whether we're in the dark dip, unsure and scared, hurting, and feeling abandoned and forsaken. God, we will praise you. Jesus, your words are powerful. Your words on the cross are powerful, but they can be so painful at the same time. But you're okay with that. And that's one of the things I'm so thankful for is that you get it. You've been there. You felt every pain that we can possibly imagine through it, you bring us hope, God. And so I pray for the people in this room right now that are in that dark dip. I pray for those who need to know your hope, who need to see a little bit of light. And I pray that your spirit would comfort them and that your spirit would show them, God, that they don't have to stay there. That giving up and that going back isn't the answer, but looking up Pressing on and focusing on you is. Give them the strength to do that. (laughs) We don't get to do it on our own. We can't do it on our own, but we need you. And we thank you that you are there with us. In Jesus' name.